Hello. 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 Someone comment if you can hear me. You should be able to hear me right now. I see six folks. Somebody just comment if you can hear me and I'll begin. Hello. Mic check. Abba Thomas, one, 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 one. Can you hear me, Abba Thomas? Oh, I'm good? Perfect. All right. I have got here, Wakulan Taya, but a Mertamas Calvus, a Mab, a well woman first could do, Saduam, Lak, but at the Silasians, a Amman with mice and a Kaida Kakaisi, but at Mazati, a Mirk at this beta Christian and Tetis, a Mariam Zion, Lalama Alam. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you, whoever else is on the Calgary page, as well as Abba Thomas, as well as our sister Timbita, for letting me know that the audio is good. The video looks good. I could already tell that. But whenever you are dealing with these things, whether it's in a pandemic or not, you want to make sure that the technology is there. And that leads me actually into one of my first points. So today, I have the audacity or the boldness to try to introduce to you all the text known as Galatians or the Epistle to the Galatians or Malik Tabasaba Galatia. And so the epistle or letter to the Galatians is, I think, a good message for us in this time, especially for those of us in communities of mixed ethnicities, because it is essentially about how people of different backgrounds can come and eat at the same table, can have table fellowship or kinonia, that's the Greek term, together. And that table fellowship is, of course, at the table of the Lord. So during this pandemic, or this time of chaos, it's much like other times of chaos, other times that are unexpected. Some people, to use the language of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, the flaneur and the probabilist, the data scientist, the complexity scientist and orthodox Christian, some people are fragile, some people are robust, and some people are anti-fragile. The fragile people are people who when chaos and disorder comes into their life, they come off worse. The robust people are those who are able to survive chaos or disorder. And the anti-fragile people or the anti-fragile people, depending on your pronunciation, are those who gain from disorder. Those who are better off when chaos is there, who when everything is getting shaken, when there's a hubbub, when there's a brouhaha, they're able to find stability. They're able to find their anchor in their Lord and in their savior and the scriptures in which he unveiled or uncovered himself. There's a man in Southern California in the Orange County region by the name of Grant who runs a strength company. He's actually been distributing Nassim Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile, lately. And it's been very exciting to see what he's been doing. His gym used to have a lot of people, but obviously it had to close down along with everything else that was closed down in the crisis. So what did he do? Did he sit down? Did he twiddle his thumbs and say, oh my is me, mea culpa, my bad, what can I do? No, he acted. And it's a great example for all of us. He disassembled all of the squat racks, all of the weights, all of the workout equipment in his gym, and he distributed them as an act of service to all of his members. And then he began charging people who are not his members. He started off by making wood beams, and then he started making steel beams to show you how he began evolving and evolving. All of this in the past two months during this crisis. And now he's built over 200 home gyms. Imagine that, over 200 home gyms, and still those people are paying him to get video chat coaching, him and, and other coaches. So it's a phenomenal example. 
Um, the physical is something that is always an example or an illustration for the spiritual. Father Josiah Trenum, an arch priest also in Southern California in, in Riverside, actually, at St. Andrew's Parish, is very famous. He has a great book, Marriage and Virginity, according to John Chrysostom. If you're looking for some literature during this time, I would definitely recommend that book for you. It's very heavy on, on these um, sources or texts from John Chrysostom, who's one of the best, if not the best preachers of all time in any language, in any place, anywhere. And he spent a great deal of time in the scriptures. In fact, one time he spent an entire year every Sunday just preaching on Genesis. You would think that like other people, he would want to move on to another subject, but he had the ability to be anchored and present in the topic at hand. And he gave Genesis its due, spending an entire year on it on Sundays. Can you imagine learning about one book for a whole year? The amount of tigat, the amount of patience, the amount of just watchfulness and alertness and focus that it takes to be able to do that. Anyway, Father Josiah Trenum, on the recent passing of Kobe Bryant, had a message in which he said he used to feel guilty about his lack of spiritual discipline when he saw the physical discipline of Kobe Bryant. A lot of people now are watching The Last Dance with Michael Jordan, the reason that I ever picked up a basketball. When you're watching The Last Dance, you may think that Jordan, prior to this, was all talent, but you see how much hard work and how much teamwork and how much faith or trust he had in his collaborators, right? To search for Dennis Rodman for that long, to put all those hours in the gym, to show people that he's a defensive player in addition to an offensive player. What you can do from these physical examples, from the guy, Grant, who has a gym, from Kobe Bryant, who lived a phenomenal life in basketball, and as well as in basketball, Michael Jordan. We can take their physical discipline and be inspired to insert that level of discipline, waking up early every morning and putting in time into the Holy Scriptures, into reading the commentaries of the fathers and into singing the melodies and the tunes and the tones and the chants of the church so that it seeps into our very blood, into our veins, so that everything that we see is through Christ, so that we don't live fragmented lives, so that we don't live compartmentalized lives, but so that every single thing we do is through the lens of Christ. The issue with the churches of Galatia and Asia Minor is that they were not able to see everything through Christ. They saw some things through Christ, and then they saw some things according to their own cultural traditions, which had become irrelevant in Christ. Not that they are commanded to not do them, because even that itself would be establishing another idol. It's one idol to tell someone to do something that is not necessary. It's another idol to tell somebody to not to do something. So those who eat and those who don't eat, we'll come back to that point. In any event, you have to just take advantage of every single aspect of this time where you're able to find an avenue to look through Christ. To give you just another silly example of things that are in popular literature, uh, in the past couple of days, I've seen Mr. T, right? If you, hopefully you know who Mr. T is. If not, do a, a quick search engine search on Google or DuckDuckGo or Bing or Yahoo and come back and tell me who Mr. T is. Mr. T has been posting about scriptures from the Johnine literature or from the Gospel of John or the, the letters of John as well. He's also been posting from Hebrews, right, on Twitter. On Instagram Live, we saw DMX, who I know a lot of you should also know, opened up the book of Masafa Mekabib or the scroll of Ecclesiastes from the wisdom literature of the Older Testament, and he began reading it on his Instagram Live. So just, just imagine, just imagine, how different people, whether they be celebrities or not, or ordinary people, are taking advantage of this age, taking advantage of the technology, of the tools we have at our disposal, and just sowing that seed of the word of God. A lot of the sowing that I do is with my podcast at Tawahado Bible Study. You can find the Tawahado Bible Study in your Apple podcasts, in your Google podcasts, or in Spotify. So I encourage you to find Tawahado Bible Study 
you can either search it by Tawahado alone, T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O, or the full Tawahado Bible study. You'll be able to find it. It's a part of a resurgence or a new renaissance of Orthodox Christian biblical scholarship that is happening in writing and in audio and in video. So if you go to ephesusschool.org, you'll see five different podcasts on YouTube, in blog form, and in the audio form from priests in St. Paul, Minnesota, in Chicago, Illinois, in Wichita, in LA, like me. And it just shows you, again, what can you do with your time to dedicate yourself? And extensively, the folks of the Ephesus School Network have written about Galatians. So I suggest for you that there are, I think, three different books on the subject, one by Father Paul Nadim Trazi, one by Father Mark Bulos, and another by, I believe, Father Lawrence. I may have butchered his last name. I, di I didn't read that third book yet, so that's probably why I don't know his name as well. But especially in the writings of Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, he talks about Galatia as a cosmopolitan or a, met um, a metropolis, which is a large city, but it's not quite as large as Rome. So from where he is positioned, you know, where they originally are in the larger Syrian desert and in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas, if you are looking towards Rome, if you're eventually thinking about going to Rome and then past Rome to Spain and to Portugal, to what is their known ends of the of the earth or their known Aznafa Midr. If you're trying to go to the Midr to show that the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ needs to spread spread throughout all the land occupied by all human beings to the best of their knowledge, Rome is the biggest city on that way. And yet before you get to Rome, you enter this region known as Galatia or Galatia. And Father Paul Terrazzi identifies this region as one of the largest cities as a halfway point to Rome. In between Los Angeles and Vegas, you have an area known as Barstow, which a lot of people stop by, whether they're going from LA to Vegas or Vegas to LA, they often stop for gas or food in Barstow. So you could think of Galatia as this area like Barstow. And Barstow itself has a bunch of smaller cities around it, like Newberry Springs, in which we find St. Anthony's Coptic Orthodox Monastery, which I'm sure some of our audience may be familiar with and, and may have visited for a spiritual retreat to get a little bit of renewal. And so Galatia is this great cosmopolitan area. It's the city area. These are city folks, right? So you have here people who are Jews, who know Greek culture, and then people who are Greeks or Gentiles. And this term is used generically just to say anyone who's not a Jew. And all of these people who are being addressed by the Apostle Paul, of course, there are people not being addressed who are in that city, but all of the people being addressed by the Apostle Paul are worshipers of Christ. They're followers of the way. They're called Christians first in Antioch. And so in this area where the churches of Galatia are assembled, you have the next big thing, the next big city besides Rome. So you can imagine this is as if the shots are being fired. The initial shot has been fired. A warning signal has been sent to Rome. The gospel is coming to destroy you. The gospel is coming to renew you. The gospel is coming to bless you. The gospel is coming to wreck your world and change it and build a new one, to change all of the infrastructure, to change all of the systems, to flip whatever ideology you have on its head with a counter ideology, to take your worship of death and to give it an, insert, an inserting of life, to take your view of fear and instead to instill hope. That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to do in the letter to the Galatians. He skips the normal Thanksgiving. We know how important Thanksgiving is in our culture. Uh, that's how we start our gubai. That's how we start our gatherings. We always start by calling upon Sima Salasi, by calling upon the holy names of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we know how important Thanksgiving is. Even when we leave, when we're about to eat food and then we leave, we say sibhat, we say our prayer of glory that we find in Zotar Salot, in the daily prayers of the Gezrite or the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church. So we know how important Thanksgiving is. And yet 
the Apostle Paul has no time for Thanksgiving here. Here he goes right into the action, talking about his apostleship, talking about how it's neither from men nor through men, but it's commissioned by God and he's being sent forth by God. He has a direct revelation that we find in the Acts of the Apostles or the book of Acts chapter 8. The next chapter, of course, is the famous chapter, chapter 9 of the Ethiopian eunuch. But in chapter 8, we see Saul, the person who was asked for, mirroring Saul the king, whom the Israelites asked for in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8. We see the new Saul who was persecuting the churches of God, violently ravaging them, holding the clothes of the church's martyrs like Stephen as they're being stoned to death, delighting. And on the road to Damascus, he gets this bright light that blinds him and he can't see, he can't eat, and he can't drink for three days. He's forced to fast. And within that fasting, there's this revelation from our Lord Jesus who says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my disciples? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my little ones? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my children? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my students? He says, Saul, Saul, you who was asked for, you who was asked for, why are you persecuting me? And he goes, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, and all these other pleasantries. But from that moment on, his life is changed. He receives this phenomenal gospel and this mission, which our great father amongst the saints, the Syriac saint, Yaakob Zesarug wrote about. Mary Hansberry, in collaboration with St. Vladimir's Seminary, the top Orthodox seminary in the United States, translated for us, this these series of homilies of Yaakob Zasarug. You might know Yaakob Zasarug from Kadase Yaakob Zasarug, which is one of our many liturgies, one of our many forms of worship services. You might know him from the hymns of our church, especially during this Paschal season. And, and such other hymns. You, you might be familiar with Yaakob Zasaruk. He's a great Syrian father. And he has this um, collection of homilies that Mary Hansberry translated for us called On the Mother of God. And here, he's always talking about the incarnation with Mary, right? Her giving birth to our Lord and Savior. And in one of the areas, he describes something which is what got the Apostle Paul so excited to talk with the people in the churches of Galatia. He says, the firmament, right? The firmament is one of those funny biblical terms we don't really use anywhere else. You could call it the vault of the sky. I'm, I'm writing a book on Genesis and I translate it as the vault of the sky or the vault of heaven, the safe, the roof, or the vault of the heavens or of the sky, right? So it's up. The firmament sent a messenger or an angel. The firmament sent a messenger to distant places to announce to the earth that the Lord of the heavens had risen from the depths, not just from the earth, but from the depths, which are even lower. This great announcement of the angel Gabriel, that original preacher, that original Maghabi Hadis, that original patron or feeder of the new, of the newer Testament, right? This message of incarnation, of the word being made flesh, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ being born and the consequences thereof, of how we should behave, how we should not have ethnic strife, how we can't have tribal beef, how we can't be at odds with one another, but rather how we need kinonia, how we need table fellowship, how we need to be able to break bread with one another. That is what changed the life of the Apostle Paul. Being Saul, the one who's asked for, and being transformed into Paul, the little one 
the Dekik Mamush, if you will. So his great mission is the title of Father Mark Bulos's book on the subject. It's to bring the Torah to the Gentiles. The Torah is many things. It is the law. It is the instruction. It is the Hebrew Bible or the Older Testament as an entirety or as a totality. But it's also the salvation or the deliverance that God promised to Israel. Israel, he who contends with God, he who does jujitsu with God, he who wrestles with God, he who struggles with God, is another name for Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. And so God has a covenantal relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is why when people pass in our church, when people fall asleep with the Lord, we say, Nefsimar, may the Lord have mercy on you. But then we say, may God have you rest in the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, May you live and reside and dwell in the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in their ukf, in their bosom, where they can embrace you, where you can be in paradise, right? That covenantal relationship is established with a randomly chosen people. Think about it as God doing a survey. He's doing a survey. He, for every survey, you have a sample size people that you then take that data and apply it to the population at large or writ large. So the sample size are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and thus Israel and the Israelites who come from that. But the original plan of God is for all of creation, for all the children of, of Adam, all the Ben Adam, all the children or the sons of the groundling and of Eve, and Mahal, the mother of life. So all the children of the groundling and the mother of life are meant to have the salvation or deliverance of God. So the Torah is that salvation and deliverance delivered in covenant relationship to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to the Israelites. But then, even within the Older Testament, we find hintings in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, really everywhere, that we need to present this deliverance and salvation to the nations, to the peoples, to the Gentiles, to everyone else. In Exodus and in Jeremiah and in Deuteronomy, we hear that circumcision is not just of the lips. Circumcision, uh, rather, excuse me, circumcision is not just in the private parts. You have such thing as circumcised and uncircumcised lips. You have such thing as circumcised and uncircumcised hearts, which are not the dwelling places of our feelings or our Valentine's Day cards but rather in the Semitic mind, in the Semitic thinking, the place where your thoughts reside. So we need to have circumcised thoughts, which lead to circumcised words, which hopefully lead to circumcised deeds. This is the cycle which our, our priests use all the time when we close in prayer at the end of the liturgy, when they say, may all of the sins that you do both wittingly and unwittingly, both be known to you and unbeknown to you, be forgiven. In thought, in word, and in deed. In thought, in speaking, and in your actions. So we are constantly praying that we are released from that. And the goal of the Torah to the Gentiles is to have salvation and deliverance for all of humanity. That is what breaking bread means. That's what table fellowship means. And that's what the churches of Galatia were failing to do. That's why the apostle Paul had to step in. Later on, he talks about how he writes this letter with such large words, indicating that sometimes the things that he says are written by him are dictated by him. But this one was actually written by his own hand and he wrote it emphatically. He wrote it to make a point. He said, Man no azim Who put a curse on you? Who bewitched you? That's later on. I'm getting ahead of myself. So in this topic, we have Jews and we have Greeks. We have Jews 
and we have goyim or Gentiles. We have people who are supposed to be at odds with each other. But in Christ, all people are supposed to be together. All people are children of Adam and of Eve, as I said before. They want to, um, particularly, I say, I say they, let me define they. The bis hasawian are these people that are talked about in our Tirigwame and Mas'ayf Tbet, which is the Ethiopian school of biblical exegesis. So in the Ethiopian school of biblical interpretation, interpretation of scripture, we are constantly told about these bis hasawian. The bis hasawian are deceitful brethren, deceitful brothers. It begins with, and this is a shocker, the heads of the apostles, the people who are known as pillars, James and John and Peter, also called Kepha or Cephas here, which is the Aramaic for rock. Peter is uh, Latinized or, or Greek uh, versions of the word rock, but Kepha or Cephas is the Aramaic or more Semitic way of saying rock. It's the same name. It's just in a different language. It's like saying Henoch and Enoch right? Elias and Elias, or Elias and Elijah. It's the same name, but it's just in a, in a different language. So those people are now training other people to stop eating together. They say the Jews eat at this table, the Gentiles eat there. Or if you want to be a Gentile and eat with the Jews, then you're going to have to eat like the Jews eat. You're going to have to eat kosher. You're going to have to honor the Sabbath day, the original Sabbath, Saturday of rest like we do, and you're going to have to make sure that you're circumcised as well. The Apostle Paul was thinking that it is not relevant to be circumcised, nor is it relevant to be non-circumcised, meaning that Gentiles cannot say you have to uncircumcise yourself. You can't even really do that. They can't say you have to not honor the Sabbath, and they can't say you have to not eat kosher. At the same time, those who are of circumcision and Sabbath honoring and keeping kosher cannot then force that upon other people. As you are, you come together to fulfill the royal law, the law of the king, which is to love God and to love your neighbor. Fikra Xavier wa fikra bis. You love God who is invisible by obeying him, by loving the visible human beings that he put in front of you. Aratnata, full stop, period. That's it. That's it. And that fleshed out constantly, repetitively, and with different narratives and stories is the entirety of the scripture. It's what Mr. Rogers, whose documentary I saw recently, Would You Be My Neighbor? I suggested if you have HBO, go check that out soon or, or find it wherever you may on Amazon or wherever it may be. Mr. Rogers dedicated decades of his life, and he was a Presbyterian minister. He dedicated decades of his life to this ministry of neighbor love, to focusing on people who are neglected in his time and place, who are children. And even today, people are neglected uh, who are children. And in the Gospels, we see that the children are neglected even by the apostles. So you have to give place to children. I'm, I'm glad to this Facebook page for giving me the opportunity to speak to the English-speaking masses who are predominantly children, I know some adults may be listening as well, but who are predominantly children here of North America and Canada and the United States, and indeed throughout the English-speaking world, whomever may have this shared with them. But Mr. Rogers focused on uniting the blacks and whites of his day because when people were having issues and arguments in the United States about whether black people and white people could swim in the same pools, he subtly or not so subtly, depending on your level of intelligence, attacked this with the power of the gospel, with the might of the gospel. No, he didn't get into fist fights because that's not how the power of the gospel is showed. Instead, he says, hey, officer, to this black officer who is one of his actors, and he has him come in for the scene, and he has a little uh, bowl on the floor, and he has his feet in there, and he's casually washing his feet, and he says, how are you doing here? And here, like Jesus and like our own sanasarat or etiquette during Maundy Thursday of Holy Work Week or Samuna Hamamat, the week of sufferings, he has his black friend, the officer, wash his feet in the same little bowl as him. And then he proceeds to wash the feet 
of this black officer as well. People were scandalized, just as the churches of Galatia were probably scandalized by this message of Paul, because this message of Paul is scandalizing to some, and others just view it as dumb. But it is the wisdom of God for all ages, for all times, and for all places. It is to be read aloud to the churches of Galatia, and it is to be read aloud to us in the 21st century by Facebook Adam. So it is a universal message of a universal God who wants you to love him by obeying him, by loving the people that are in front of you. And yet we have here two anathemas. He says, he says it twice. He says, let them be anathema. Let them be accursed. Who? The people who are sowing seeds of discord. The bis hasawian, the deceitful brethren. He says, even if I were to come back to you, meaning the Apostle Paul, even if I were to come back to you, this person who has a, miss a mission from a direct revelation of Jesus Christ, right? Even if I were to come back to you with a different message, do not trust me. If the bis hasawian, if the deceitful brethren come to you with a different message, do not trust them. Even if a malaka birhan, even if an angel of light comes, do not trust them because they could be a malaka salmat. They could be an angel or a messenger of darkness. So you have to watch out and you have to understand the nature of this message. He goes out into the desert. The Ethiopian school of biblical exegesis or of scriptural interpretation, our Tirgwame and Mas'ayft, is very interesting here. He says, it says here that he used to be someone who has mi'imanan kalubet yemaya sadr, kamiyadrubet yemaya wil. So he says, it says here in the tradition, in the interpretation school, that the Apostle Paul was someone who used to find the faithful or the laity, the believers, if they were sleeping, he wouldn't let them spend the day in that place. If he found them spending the day in that place, he wouldn't let them sleep in that place. That's how much he was ravaging the church. That's how much he was committing violence against the church. And this same person, though he has a little name change, goes into the Arab. It says here, Gra graun hida. It, it's such a strange Amharic saying, and uh, I'm I'm the best Amharic speaker, reader, writer, you name it. Born and raised in the United States, my brother in, in Canada, Johannes Getaun Malke, has got you amongst the Canadians. But I, I'm the best amongst Amharic speakers, and I had trouble trying to understand even the Amharic of what our our Abbat, which our fathers were saying here. So I had some conversations with my parents. And even then, they had a little bit of trouble with it. So we're working with it. So our Ethiopian school of biblical exegesis or of scriptural interpretation says, Gra graun hida, for 14 years. So he goes into the desert. He goes into what basosoinya, in human speech, we would refer to as the wrong way. You know how biased we are against the left hand, right? This is my right, by the way. This is the left. It gets switched on uh, these cameras. So you know how biased we are in our culture, which is similar. It's a Semitic culture against the left. So Gra Graun is the left of the left. He went the wrong way. He went an unexpected way. He went into the wilderness and desert, the place in which you must rely solely upon the grace of God. And he was teaching people this message. He barely interacted with anybody except with Peter, whom he calls by his Aramaic name, but either way, he's the rock. And then with James or Jacob, who is the brother of the Lord. Those are the only people that he spoke with. This shows you he didn't learn this from them. He just communicated with them as equals, with them giving the message of salvation to the Jewish Christians and him bringing it to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews who wanted to follow the way, who wanted to follow Christ. And yet here, they're perturbing his service. They're messing with his agalgalot. They're sowing seeds of discourse, which we hear about in the book of Proverbs as something that 
نفسو آت بقوي مسايف that his soul or his breath of life abominates, really hates and despises the sowing of discord among the brethren. So he's taking this discord and he's trying to bring harmony. He's trying to bring unity. He's trying to bring back the bread breaking with one another at the same table, not at different tables, at the same table. Otherwise, it is not the table of the Lord. And yet he's saying, let them be anathema, let them be accursed, anyone who disagrees with this because of the importance of this. In 1 Corinthians 5, we see this horrendous person, right, who is doing intercourse with their stepmother. And that person is excommunicated, is anathematized, is considered accursed. But even that person is invited back because the goal of any anathema, the goal of any cursing, is to re-invite that person, to admonish them, to rebuke them, and to teach them unto life so that they can live, not so that they could not live, but so that they could live again by receiving his flesh and by participating in his blood. And so it's a re-invitation to qurban. Qurban is the same sarwak al or root word as qirb. It is the process by which we get closer and closer and closer to God. He is holy and he told us to be holy. He is perfect and he told us to be perfect. So we edge closer and closer to him with penitent lives, but always focusing on the kinonia, always focusing on the table fellowship, always focusing on the breaking of bread. It says here again in our Tirgwame and Mazayef, or the Ethiopian school of biblical exegesis, and scriptural interpretation. Sawanis deslamasanyet ye misha kahon hu ye Christos tagaj idol lahum. Sawanis deslamasanyet ye misha kahon hu ye Christos tagaj idol lahum. If I prefer to people please, then I am not in submission to Christ. If I am a people pleaser, if I'm trying to please men, if I'm a people pleaser, then I am not one who submits to Christ. In our daily prayers, we say, Niganni laka igzi'o. We submit to you, O Lord. In Qaddasi, right before the associate deacon is telling the princes or the rulers, open the gates, right in that sequence of the Sarawita Malaikt or of the bodiless hosts encircling the savior of the world saying, yay, 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 or whoa, whoa, whoa. We conclude, especially in the Lord's liturgy, but you could say it in any liturgy, la Christos neganni. We submit to Christ. So whether it's in our liturgy or in our daily prayers, we say that we submit to Christ. I want to ask you, are we submitting to Christ? In our communities, whether we're Ethiopian or Eritrean, do we ever put our Ethiopian and Eritrean cultural traditions before the cross? It's a question we have to ask ourselves at the synodal level, at the diocese level, or the archdiocese level, our jurisdiction or series of churches, at the parish level, right? Our particular church we visit, and then at the household or familial level, and then at the individual level. At each stage, we have to ask ourselves the question. Of course, there's great overlap. Being Ethiopian or being Eritrean, you know, politeness aside, is almost the same thing as being Christian. A lot of our culture is baptized. But we have Melkam Tufit and Good Jiban. We have good traditions and we have harmful traditions and we have to be able to tell the difference in the gis or the infinitive study of languages kadasa is amasagana but kadasa is also layya kadasa is to make holy to sanctify and one of the translations or interpretations is to give thanks but another translation or interpretation is to distinguish to set apart to make different, 
to make special, to make taboo. And so we have to ask ourselves, if we are trying to be holy in pursuit of God, if we are trying to increase this table fellowship, when have we sacrificed table fellowship or crucifying our own particular way in which we want everybody to look the same instead of the unity and diversity that is the message of the gospel? When have we done that? We have to ask ourselves that. And when we answer that question, we will be able to know whether or not we are following the message of Galatians. Now, this is an intro and it's probably gone on too long, but I went all this time without actually reading Galatians. So I'm going to close today by reading for you Galatians chapter one, and I'm going to invite you for homework to read chapters two, three, four, five, and six. Pace yourself. If you could do it in a day, if it takes you a week, that's fine. Doing it about one a day, it'll take you a little bit less than a week. In any event, take your time. If English is your language, read in English. If you can, read it in all the languages. But always remember, for the New Testament, Greek takes precedence. So if you can, look up the mounts or another interlinear text. You can find that on BibleGateway.com, and you can find Greek words. And if you see something funny going on in the text, you could do a quick search on your favorite search engine, right? Google or DuckDuckGo. And you could say, hey, what does that word mean? What's the relevance of this word? You could look up various commentaries. Try John Chrysostom. Try any of your favorite fathers, Ephraim the Syrian, and just type Galatians. See if they've written about it. See which fathers have written about it. If you could find the Andimta or the Terguam and Mas'ayft or the Ethiopian School of Biblical Exegesis and Scriptural Interpretation, go and find that. Bicha, make sure you read Galatians and try to read it in community in addition to reading it by yourself. If you understand one kufl or one section of the Bible really well by reading it over and over again, by listening to it on an audio Bible if you're too lazy to read, or because you want to supplement your reading, then you'll be able to see that same message elsewhere. Because scripture, again, is the same message from Orid Zafitra to Yohannes Rai, from Genesis to John's Revelation. It is about neighbor love as a response in obedience to God love. The letter of Paul to the Galatians. I'll be reading from a contemporary translation of the former Bishop of Durham, N.T. Wright. Paul, an apostle, my apostleship doesn't derive from human sources, nor did it come through a human being. It came through Jesus, the Messiah, and God, the Father, who raised him from the dead, and the family who are with me to the churches of Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus the Messiah our Lord, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory to the ages of ages. Amen. I am astonished that you are turning away so quickly from the one who called you by grace and going after another gospel. Not that it is another gospel. It's just that there are some people stirring up trouble for you and wanting to pervert the gospel of the Messiah. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should announce a gospel other than the one we announce to you, let such a person be accursed, anathema, wuguza. I said it before, and I now say it again. If anyone offers you a gospel other than the one you received, let that person be regum, accursed. Well now, does that sound as though I'm trying to make up to people or to God, or that I'm trying to curry favor with people? If I were still pleasing people, I wouldn't be a slave of the Messiah. You see, brothers and sisters, let me make it clear to you. The gospel announced by me is not a mere human invention. I didn't receive it from human beings, nor was I taught it. It came through an unveiling or uncovering of Jesus the Messiah. That's the word that apocalypse comes from in the Greek. You heard, didn't you, the way I behaved when I was still within Judaism. I persecuted the church of God violently and ravaged it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my own age and people. 
I was extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to unveil his son in me so that I might announce the good news about him among the nations, immediately I did not confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. No, I went away to Arabia and afterward returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to speak with Cephas. I stayed with him for two weeks. I didn't see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Look, I'm not lying. The things I'm writing to you are written in God's presence. Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I remained unknown by sight to the Messianic assemblies in Judea. They simply heard that the one who had been persecuting them was now announcing the good news of the faith, which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Glory to God for all things. Um, I have completed my discussion. Diakon Elias, who invited me here, said that there may or may not be some questions. I could try to stay on for a few minutes to address some questions. Now I hadn't really looked at the comments except the early ones. So now I see there are a few of you here. Thank you for throwing those links up. Salam la lanta yuhun. Praise the Lord. Excellent. Let's see. There will be a short question period. Okay. I know we're still working with these things, so we will see whether or not there are any questions. It's okay, we could just keep looking at each other. I'll give it a, a few minutes just in case, and then I will close it. Amen. Okay, no questions as of now. Going once, going twice. I'm just going to assume that I had the clearest teaching ever. No questions about Galatians. Thank you. Ah, here we go. <laughs> what do you think about... Oh, hold on. The comments are moving around. Uh, there we go. What do you think about the coronavirus closing down churches? You know, obviously I have mixed feelings. It's not exactly related to Galatians, but I'll try to make it related. So um, the churches being closed are something that we're sad, but we have to understand that it is the love of God and the love of their neighbors which drove our holy synod filled with our holy patriarchs, Abba Mercorios and Abba Matias, along with all of the other bishops, the bishop who ordained me, the scribe of the synod, Abba Yosef, who announced it to close the churches. So in one respect, I'm sad that they're closed, but another respect, uh, but in another um, respect, I'm glad that our fathers the Holy, uh, of the Holy Synod are showing us a new way that we could never think of to be obedient to them and to love our neighbors. Did you ever think that you could love your neighbors and obey the Holy Synod by not going to church? We used to not think that was possible. Also, church is usually thought of by people as the building in a certain time in a certain place on Sundays. In fact, though, in the monasteries in Ethiopia, churches run every day. And even now, the clergy are still there throwing up prayers on our behalf, especially the monastics, but also the married priests. So now it's given us an opportunity to turn up the level of service that we are doing uh, from home. As myself, I've you know relaunched my podcast, which I used to have a few years ago from 2016 to 2017. I also have a private Bible study 
with the parishioners that I minister to at Virgin Mary's or Dingil Mariam or Mariam Dingil, the Ethiopia Orthodox Taido Beta Christian uh, or Cathedral. It is the Manvera Pesana Besuabuna Bernavas. And so I have the adults in their 20s, 30s, and 40s there. And we meet from video chat and over the phone every Sunday, you know, according to God's will. And at the same time, I'm able to to do the things with the Ephesus School Network that I've said. So, uh, so those two things, I think, will hopefully answer your question. The one, that it shows us a new way to be obedient to our Holy Synod and a new way to love our neighbors at the direction of our Holy Synod. And then two, the church closure allows us to be innovative in using tools we already have. Did this mic already exist? Did these headphones already exist? Absolutely. Was I using them before the pandemic? No. So even I was sitting on my laurels. So now, you know, crises precipitate change and we have to make sure we are anti-fragile, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, or people who are able to be better off due to chaos of church closure and, and other types of chaos that come. Uh, can you do mazmur once a week? Uh, so uh, I'll leave that to the wonderful Mazamaran. I hope that's directed at the page rather than at me. Thank you. Any other questions? You can, making it relevant to the churches of Galatia. Going once. It's an eye opener. It is an eye opener. No? Okay. Going once, going twice. Sold. Okay. All right. May the love of God the Father, the grace of his one-of-a-kind Son, and the communion of the Holy Ghost. Oh, <laughs> Tinvita came in with the last-minute question. Okay, she got me. Galatians teaches us table fellowship. Corinthians says not to associate with sinners. Where do you draw the line between the two? Great question. So if you recall from one of the examples I gave in 1 Corinthians 5, it says that they rendered one of the people in their community unto Satan. Uh, that's a very powerful saying, to render someone unto Satan. And yet whenever they rendered that person unto Satan, you have to remember it wasn't some Alamawi person. Someone that we think of as a sinner, ruk yohono, or someone who's distant. That person was within that community. That person is baptized. And, you know, for our modern language, it doesn't quite make sense in that time. But for our modern language, we could say that person was orthodox. So it wasn't some random alamawi or worldly person. And so they took someone from within their church and they rendered them onto Satan, which means you can't take kurban. You can't eat his flesh and drink his blood anymore. But they always left room to re-invite that person back. So the emphasis in Galatians doesn't clash because in Galatians, what Paul is addressing directly is people sowing discord and pushing people out based on something which is arbitrary, which is not even sin-based, but just cultural. And they tried to make that an idol that they put above Christ. But in any event... In both Corinthians and in Galatians, the idea is to bring the community together around Christ. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? I mean, lot to sabat. Okay. May the love of God the Father, the grace of his one-of-a-kind Son, Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Ghost remain with you all forever. Farewell. Until next time.